Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Joe Quinn, who is a professor of classics, but also, I guess, archaeology, history, I mean, a whole bunch of different things at Oxford University, also the author of this recent book, which is kind of, a, it's, a, it's like a magnum opus. I mean, it's pretty big. It's called How the World Made the West and a 4,000 year history. I mean, this book is, uh, welcome, Joe, first of all, <laughs> I'm glad you could join. <laughs> Thank you um, for having me. But I mean, look, this book covers so much ground. I mean, 4,000 years of history, and it covers virtually the entire planet. And, you know, I've read a bunch of books recently that encompass a lot of territory, uh, both temporally and geographically. But this seems to go against almost everything <laughs> that we do as as historians, which emphasize the you know, depth rather than, than breadth. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering how you're able to do this before you're, you know, 80 years old and, and emeritus, right? Number one. But uh, <laughs> I think, I'm not sure I could have done it before I was 50 years old. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I know what you mean. The, um, the difference between the parachutists and the truffle hunters. Um, and I think that the, the the reason I feel reasonably confident about it is that I am by nature a truffle hunter, not a parachutist. And an awful mm -hmm. lot of my academic work really is about, you know, interrogating a very specific small passage of text or a specific object or a small phenomenon or something. I'm really trying to get as much squeeze as much as I can out of it. Um, and so I kind of have those sort of instincts. And so in order to write this book, I had to kind of learn to let go a little bit. But I knew that having that kind of basic approach meant that uh, I, I hopefully wouldn't go too far wrong. It did mean that I went down some rabbit holes during the re research stage. Um, there's an a awful lot that I could tell you about the collapse of the Bronze Age that you really don't want to know. <laughs> but I didn't well, put it in the book. <laughs> Well, I, I, before I knew, I could kind of sense you had an affinity for these Phoenicians, right? So when I later <laughs> did a little research, I, I wonder what her specialization actually was. And then I, I found out. But um, I think the main thrust of the book, I mean, the thesis of, of the book is that we have both professional historians and sort of amateur consumers of history have a a view of history, which you call civilizational thinking. And there's there's... I mean, there's two kinds of civilizational thinking. I think there's one which is sort of the, the the teleological one, right, where, you know, societies just get more and more civilized over time. But then there's this other one, which uh, I think you spend most of your time on, which is that, you know, these civilizations evolve autarkically, and then occasionally we'll have some intermingling. Um, and and it, it reminded me of, you know, when Sometimes, I mean, I cook a lot, and so sometimes you'll read these recipes where they'll say, you know, cook all the individual vegetables separately, and then at the last minute, combine them into a soup. And and that seems to be, you know, and you're saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, that's not how the world was made. It was sort of all these vegetables were kind of cooking simultaneously. And and I wonder, the you know, when we're, when we're trying to understand why people do this civilizational thinking, Part of it is because they want to tell a particular story, but it seems like part of it is a function of, of you know, not only how we do research, right, where the archaeologists will plop down into, you know, Crete and find some isolated artifacts, but also just in order to make sense of our past. Because, you know, when you do it your way, when you tell history your way, I, I think it, it it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. You know, everything kind of blends into this, gray, you know, this is brown, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to tell a story. So do, does civilizational thinking arise out of the, the research methods, out of the, the, the desire to have a, um, a teleological narrative, or is it just simply as a way of kind of organizing our thoughts about the past? <laughs> 
I love I love that idea that it, it it does make things easier. Certainly, I yeah. mean, my previous book, as you say, was about um, Phoenicians, and even though I was kind of arguing that that whole category is, is a sort of error in a way that that these Phoenicians didn't know they were Phoenician, it still gave me um, a framework that I could I, I I knew what counted and what didn't count, and that was something that was really tough in this book, like because it, it, everything counted. So mm. you know what what was the most important thing to include but i think um i really like the way you describe this thing i call civilizational thinking um and i think one of the things that that is often surprising to people is that the noun civilization is so modern i mean it really isn't used before the mid 18th century so you know we're talking maybe 250 years it, it's not a kind of age old idea about the world it's very much something that came along first of all as you say in this kind of teleological sense it's always used in the singular at first you just you know people are either civilized or they aren't um and and it's very much part originally of a kind of enlightenment ideas about kind of constant progress, the idea that humans kind of um, are, are in a, in a uh, sort of on a journey from being, you know, from the sort of Stone Age hunter gatherers, and then you get farming, and uh, and then eventually you get kind of business and and capitalism and all the rest of it, and and it's very much. Um, uh, a kind of idea that was in the air in the later 18th century, and and this idea of civilization was was very useful as a kind of capstone mm. to that. Um, but as you say, the thing I'm really interested in in this book is is when it becomes plural, which is only the earliest time that people are using civilization in the plural in mm. any language, as far as I know, is in the late 1820s, so less than 200 years ago. And I think that's kind of funny because they seem like a natural fact now. You know, a lot of books that are sort of about civilizations in some sense are, are about, you know, why is one civilization doing better than others or why do civilizations clash? But they never ask this really fundamental question that I'm trying to um, ask my readers here, which is why do we think in terms of civilizations at all? Um, and I think, I mean, they are, they are attractive. They help us sort the world out. They help us, uh, they help us write books more easily. Um, but I think another thing, I mean, you know, one could probably come up with a hundred kind of factors in this as for any, um, historical phenomenon. But I think one really striking one is that this idea of civilizations in the plural develops very much alongside the idea of races in the plural. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, something, you know, we no longer have the human race, you know, perhaps as opposed to animals or whatever it might be, um, you know, aliens, <laughs> uh, uh, divinity. Um, but we have, you know, individual races. And that's, again, an idea that goes back, has its roots in the 18th century, but it really takes off in the 19th century. And I think those two ideas really kind of play off each other they support each other they kind of organize the world by sort of biology and by culture and i think one of the things that was really inspiring for me uh, when i was um kind of uh, originally um trying to, to work out what this book was was really about um was uh, the work of geneticists on race um mm. you know really essentially showing that that it's just a garbage scientific concept now we know that all human beings are you know uh, much more closely related than many other mammal groups so much human beings are much more closely related than chimpanzees even though chimpanzees there are far fewer chimpanzees in the world than humans but but all humans are incredibly closely genetically related and whenever you uh, get sort of you know, obviously you know, over time, so cases of isolation and so on. Um, uh, some some sort of segments of populations get closer together, but when you pull back and look at it in that sort of larger picture of genetic science, they're just tiny little kind of um, interweavings and, and sort of journeys off and journeys back in this incredible story of humanity. So David Reich, who's the um, professor, uh, one of the professors of uh, human genetics at Harvard, I mean, he says so. Uh, we shouldn't think in terms of family trees now. We should think in terms of family trellises. And that was really an important idea for me in thinking, OK, it's actually I want to see what history looks like if we tried to think of it in terms of 
uh, you know, cultural trellises rather than these isolated kind of cultural trees of civilizations. Yeah, I mean, it seems like civilizational thinking has its origins at the point where your book actually ends, right? So, you know, your book ends with the the great voyages of of discovery, right? Where uh, the the you know the Portuguese and the Spaniards encountered a society that had evolved in a very different way, right? And had not had any kind of contact for a really long period of time. And so, I think in that sense. It, it did make sense to think, wow, these people are like super different. But prior to that, you know, the encounters were, were never that radical, right? There was just this, you know, more, lots and lots of interchange, but but nothing like that radical. And so is, is, is it that rupture, that kind of radical encounter that caused people to, to, to think that way and then kind of retroactively impose it? <laughs> on on the past i think that's right i mean i was really i i took me ages to decide where the book should begin exactly i mean almost up until the last minute but uh but i always knew that i wanted to end it right around 1500 um i wanted to end it with those transatlantic voyages um and most importantly probably with the exactly the same time the expulsion of muslims and jews from europe mm -hmm. Because it seemed yeah. to me that was, you know, the extraordinary moment of of a kind of a, a radical connection around the world. For the first time, you could really talk about a kind of global history after about 1500, right? When the Americas, essentially, you have know, a little bit longer to get to uh, Australia and so on, some parts of Australasia, but pretty much from about 1500, you know, pe people's idea of the world, people's maps of the world look pretty much like they, they do today. So on the one hand, there's this kind of great moment of what we might call globalization at that point. Um, and that's, you know, historians have made a lot of that in recent years, um, and quite rightly so. But I was really struck by the way it also involves an, a sort of radical new distinction in the world that up until now, as you say, I mean, co connectivity hasn't been all that dramatic. It's not surprising to anyone. There's, of course, it often is um, conflictual. I mean, one of the things I really uh, want people to um, take away from my book is that war is one of the most effective modes of communication that people have. Um, but, uh, but, but, but all the same, um, it, it, it depended on on a kind of fundamental, I think, notion of similarity between peoples, this idea. So, you know, you, you if you want to trade with a new people, you've got to basically believe that they're going to um, have the same ideas as you, or at least agree to the same ideas as you about trust or value and that kind of thing. And so people believe that these are things that even if they aren't actually the same, that people can communicate over, that people can establish similar ideas together. But around 1500, what's happening with this European expansion is, is, is a, I, to me, a very radical change in that, um, that at the same time as Europeans are engaging in mass conversions to Christianity overseas, they're expelling the significant Jewish and Muslim populations from Europe itself. And so it's really creating a sort of us and them situation, basically for the first time on, on a significant scale. I mean, things like that happen on a smaller scale and throughout history in all societies. But I think this is really, um, uh, in terms of a global history, something really quite new. And so to me, it is the, 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 the roots of that kind of civilizational thinking that gets fully articulated a few hundred years later, starting in the 18th century. But I really think you can see its ideological roots there. And so that was why that was why I basically stopped there. Yeah. And if you're going to if you're going to highlight differences, then that means you're going to homogenize within. And I think you talked about how it's at some point in the Christian West, there was a, a movement towards kind of more uh, homogenization. And I guess this, this came in the wake of the Crusades. Is, is that when you, you started to see sort of more of a 
identity around what it meant to be Christian and European? Right, that's right. I mean, in a way, it's a reaction against the Crusades. So what we're seeing after the, I mean, the, in the end, the kind of fundamental failure of the Crusades project, I mean, what people don't always remember is that the Crusades weren't only a question of of, of sort of, you know, Christian pilgrims going out to um, uh, make war in the Holy Land. Many of them stayed there. And they stayed there for, in some cases, you know, decades, even centuries. Um, and so, in a strange way, the period of the Crusades itself was actually a period of quite um, striking cultural interchange. I mean, it's probably what we um, owe the uh, kind of worldwide obsession with sugar to, because it was really, I mean, sugar it was people had access to sugar before the Crusades, um, you know, but it was extremely rare, extremely expensive. It was something that was traded through Arab lands and so on. Um, but it was really uh, in, in the Crusades period that, that when uh, people, when Europeans were living in places in the Holy Land, um, that they, that they had much more kind of regular access to sugar, that it became a kind of standard part of daily life. So there's a huge amount of, I think, the way we live now, if you like, in the West, that actually you can trace back, you know, paradoxically to this period when the Crusaders were going out to, in a way, sort of, you know, represent um, uh, uh, Christianity against um, the, the uh, religions that were um, in the ascendant in the Holy Land itself at that time. Now, of course, there's a lot more to the Crusades than that, and great Crusades historians would, would tell you it certainly wasn't all about religion. Religion, but it was at least a bit about religion. Um, so, so you have this, but then you have this stage where, you know, gradually all the different kind of crusader kingdoms, these tiny little kind of princelets um, are, are defeated um, uh, uh, by kind of Islamic um, uh, powers in the region of various kinds. And, and Christianity itself, which of course started out in the Levant, in you know the modern Holy Land, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, these are kind of the heartland, if you like, of uh, Christianity in its origins. Um, it actually becomes a re it sort of retreats um, back into Europe. Well, well, I mean, into Europe really. Um, and so you get a stage where, for the first time, Christianity and uh, Europe really can seem synonymous. I mean, they never are entirely synonymous, of course, but you can see how it might look that way, especially from the far West. And so there's a really interesting, and this is kind of, I suppose, the sort of earliest stages of this kind of final act of my book, where, uh, you know, distance is being placed between cultures for the first time, which is about the... Um, conquest uh, by Western Europeans, not of West Africa, the Americas, but of Eastern Europe, the conquest and conversion. And that's very much now seen, I think, by a lot of historians as the kind of proving ground for the kind of activities that Europeans were then engaging in in the Atlantic in following centuries. Um, so, yeah, I think that 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 stage where um, it, it wasn't just, I suppose, that people kind of thought of Christendom and Europe as synonymous. And in fact, Christendom was a much more common term than Europe then, meaning basically the same thing. Um, but they made it synonymous. They were actually working to do that. And that's when you begin to get sort of also the expulsions of in particular Jews from individual towns, sometimes countries and so on. And, uh, and there's a real kind of turn to culture as a marker of fundamental value. Well, also, I think this concept of Europe is is a relatively recent one. I think you give Augustine <laughs> credit for kind of uh, coining the, the term, um, and it took a while for it to kind of catch on, right? I mean, the, the notion that, that Europe was in some way distinct, and, and most maps um, sort of had the Holy Lands at the center, right, <laughs> until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. um, or or yep, Baghdad absolutely. or some other part of the world, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Mecca or, yeah. No, I mean, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, the idea of continents is, is kind of a fascinating one to me. It, it goes back, in fact, to uh, uh, ancient Greek-speaking scientists who are working on the coast of what's now Turkey, very much in touch with what was going on in the kind of big intellectual centres of antiquity, like Babylon, um, with Egyptian scientists and so on. Um, but they, I mean, we, we don't have any evidence that anybody else kind of thought about the world in terms of continents. Um, but they invented with some geographers and it was a kind of label. It wasn't a, a sort of... Um, uh, a major concept and and you get these wonderful um one of my favorite uh commentaries on it is by another greek historian herodotus so i got here i say greek greek speaking he also um was uh, from anatolia from uh, grew up in persian uh lands um but uh but but he he sort of says well you know people say that there are these three continents and they're all named after women, you know, Europa, Asia, Libya, which is the Greek term for what we now say Africa. Um, but but I think this is this is nonsense. I mean, what people don't even know where they begin and end. And mm -hmm. of course, that's right. I mean, continents, some continents exist, you know, the Americas exists, Australia exists. Um, but uh yeah, but, Turkey but Europe, part of Europe, Asia, or... and Africa. I think everyone is Turkey Europe or is it Asia? Nobody knows. I think Israel right, is in the uh, right, exactly. Euro, Euro you know, song there's all, competition. Right, the phosphorus. Right, and, right. and, and you know, does Europe end at the Caucasus? Does it end at the Urals? I mean, these are debates that have gone on for centuries because nobody really knows. Because in fact, Europe and well, until the until the digging of the Suez Canal, both Europe and Africa were essentially um, uh, peninsulas of uh, mm. of Asia. Um, so, so the whole idea of continents are great because they're, they're, they're sort of always already fictional. Um, and so you can see what people do with them. And it is true that, that so they're invented by these, these sort of Greek scientists. Um, and then for a long time, they're just used in a very sort of matter of fact way. Other geographers will use them to kind of create divisions in their works and so on. But nobody's really interested in them if they're not a kind of pretty scientific kind of geographer. And in the idea of Europe in particular is um, <clears throat> really, I mean, it's, it's not a word you would hear um, in, I mean, in the whole time of my book. In fact, it only really catches on as a popular term in the early modern period. But, um, but, but during the period that I'm writing about, you know, you get it used once or twice twice maybe in the early middle ages survive um and then there's a there's a little flurry um in toward towards towards the end of the period i'm interested in in the kind of 14th early 15th centuries um uh particularly the rise of ottoman power kind of seems to provoke a greater interest in a sort of idea of a kind of geographical cultural space called Europe, but it's absolutely still entwined with the idea of Christianity. I mean, it's one of the popes, in fact, is one of the kind of big uh, influencers who um, who really makes it quite popular briefly. Um, but he's absolutely using it, again, as a kind of synonym for Christendom. Well, I think also um, sort of in the background of your, your book, there is a, a story running in parallel, which is the story of how we discovered all of these uh, civilizations, right? And it seems like the time of discovery is really the time where nationalism was rising, right? So these folks who were, you know, going and, and doing the excavations in, in Crete and in uh, Turkey, modern day Turkey and so forth, these were, you know, these were folks that, that were swimming in a sea of the birth of the nation state, right? And so they, they would kind of map onto the, the past, this notion of, of like a nation state. I mean, like the Phoenicians, right? Or, or the, the, yes. the Greeks. I mean, there, there was no such thing, right? Um, in, in that sense. Um, so how did no, that, that shape that's, us? That's... How, how did that shape the well, way, you know, when, they, when, they land, when they parachuted into, say, Crete? And, and I think uh, that's sort of where you begin the book is right with the Minoans. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, I guess nations are another part of this story about civilizational thinking. Um, when there's a shift from that singular kind of, of idea of civilization, people can be better or worse at, um, to this idea of multiple civilizations kind of 
people have the kind of natural limits to their culture. Um, that's going along with, on the one hand, race, but it's also going along with the rise of the nation state, other kinds of particularisms, um, uh, a kind of romantic idea of, of, of individual peoples. So, um, so I think with Crete, it's actually a, a lovely um, place to see this happening um, because uh, Crete was, you know, a, 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 an island that had had so many different identities. You know, it had been Venetian, it had been uh, Islamic, it had been Christian, of course, it had been um, uh, at some stages Greek speaking. It had been, you know, you could you can write anything you like um, onto Crete, and so. One of the things that was very um, attractive to uh, uh, the early archaeologists, so including um, Arthur Evans, is of course the guy who I think uh, probably is, 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 is the best known of these early um, Cretan archaeologists. Uh, um, he was the um, uh, director of the, the Ashmolean Museum here in um, uh, Oxford, um, uh, but he he spent a lot of his later part of his life um, on Crete, and he was the excavator of Knossos, which is the kind of ca capital of ancient Bronze Age Crete. And so he had sort of two, but I guess he had, I had three. He had three uh, kind of confl somewhat conflicting instincts. So one of them was that he was absolutely soaked in civilizational thinking, and so he's thought what he was seeing here was a civilization, no question. Um, and he was very excited about it. He didn't like the idea that it might have much to do with Egypt or uh, the Levant, I mean, it's a modern day Holy Land. Um, uh, in fact, you know, spoiler, it had a lot to do with them, <laughs> but um, but he didn't he didn't so much like that idea. But mostly, he wanted to find his own civilization there, so he named his civilization Minoan after a kind of mythical king of ancient Crete, King Minos. So this was the Minoan civilization. It's actually he he slightly plagiarized that from some German scholars from earlier, but it was he made it kind of famous. This idea of Minoan Crete, a civilization of the Minoans. On the other hand, he was also um, you know, very much a kind of British uh, uh, kind of intellectual. And so he also saw in this island a kind of something a bit like Britain, a kind of strange, nicer and warmer mirror of Britain. So he thought they were a great trading power. He thought they had an empire. He thought it was all sorts of stuff, which is basically just kind of um, projection uh, by somebody mm. very familiar with a certain version of British history um, onto this kind of, you know, tabula rasa um, in a way. Uh, and then there's this kind of third aspect to it, um, which is that he didn't really want it to be Greek either, um, because he wanted it to be its own sort of special thing. So there's this, I mean, one of my favourite stories that I tell in the book is about the Min Minoans and Mycenaeans. I mean, it's a two mm -hmm. famous ancient civilizations, right? And, and in fact, the idea that these are two separate cultures is incredibly recent. It's basically a kind of Second World War era idea. Because these early archaeologists, these guys, and a lot of women as well, in fact, on Crete, um, what they thought they were finding was basically... Uh, a civilization that um, stretched across the whole of the Aegean. So the people on Crete, which is where the really early stuff is, very big, early palaces, um, they thought the stuff that people were finding on mainland Greece, places like Mycenae and sort of Bronze Age ruins, you go and kind of tour around now in Greece, completely amazing, um, lots of incredible tombs and so on. Um, they thought that was basically a kind of late decadent stage of Minoan civilization. Um, but they, the, you know, the, the core of it was on Crete. Whereas the people who were doing the excavation on the mainland, uh, people like Heinrich Schliemann and so on, and, and, and other kinds of um, sort of buccaneer archaeologists of late 19th, early 20th centuries, um, including quite a lot of Greeks, naturally thought that 
the place they were working on was the sort of center of this little universe. And so from their point of view, um, they called this civilization Mycenaean because this stuff on Crete was just a kind of primitive precursor. It's kind of where people were practicing, but then the real stuff comes in Greece itself. So the whole idea of Minoan and Mycenaean are basically just two rival labels of two sort of basically warring groups of archaeologists about exactly the same thing. And so it's, it's a complete kind of, it's like a historical typo that, that people now think of them as different. Well, I mean, what, what's astonishing to me is, right, when you read the Iliad, uh, you're talking about two groups that are different language families, right? I mean, you know, different in many ways. And yet the sort of affinities that they have for one another in that text seem to be greater than the affinities that you might see for, say, a, a German in an English memoir of World War II. I mean, and yet, you know, I mean, English and German are pretty much, you know, almost identical languages in the grand scheme of things. So, so how is it that in, in today's world where we're so much more connected, th there seems to be the ability to stir up more sense of difference than there was in those eras where, the, you know, the differences in many ways, linguistically and so forth, were, were, were greater. I mean, I, I mean, I think a lot of people, everyone's moved when they read the Iliad. I mean, it's, it's, it's astonishing. But I mean, is that, does that reflect, do you think, the, the way people thought of people from, from different, different cultures and, and different polities? Absolutely. No, I mean, I think that's actually a great example because, I mean, certainly um, the Greeks and Trojans shouldn't, in a kind of logical scenario, have been able to understand each other's language. And yet in the epic, it's just not an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do talk to each other. They do, and, and there's no, there's no people don't talk about translators or anything. And I don't think the point is that actually all these soldiers and kind of decadent kings were just such good linguists that they you know, they were all completely bilingual. Um, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's that it didn't matter. You know, it wouldn't have been interesting for the story if you know Agamemnon had to keep waiting for for the translation. Um, so right, you're, um, you're in you're in battle and you're 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 hitting yeah. each other and you got a translator there. <laughs> Do you just, see my really? <laughs> <laughs> right, it doesn't make sense, but it didn't for the story. It didn't matter. It wasn't something that Homer's original readers um, would have would have been interested in, would have minded uh -huh. about. Um, it, it, you know, the story makes sense as it is. These are people who culturally are extremely similar. You know, when you look at the sort of home life of the Trojans in uh, uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey, um, and particularly, particularly in the Iliad, of course, um, it's, uh, it's very... Um, uh, it's very similar to 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 that of the Greeks, um, and indeed of many other people as well. It's only when you get to kind of parts of the world in the Odyssey, um, like the Western Mediterranean, that things begin to get a little weird, um, uh, but uh, and a little bit more um, perhaps from some perspectives primitive and so on. So I think I think that's right. That this this kind of cultural difference. Um, it wasn't that people weren't aware of differences. I mean, between different Greek city states. I mean, all, you know, there's a massive amount of joking in Athenian comedy about the differences between Athenians and Spartans, uh, Athenians and, and anybody else, really. So, so it's not that people kind of just didn't, you know, they weren't very observant or something. But the, but it didn't really matter on a fundamental level. And I think that's that's a. I mean, in a way, it's one of the things that really drew me to this, these kinds of stories because. As a classicist, I think I was slightly offended by the idea that Greece and Rome have roots of Western civilization, because that's so different from what Greek and Roman authors themselves say. You know, they really recognize um, the uh, the sort of uh, roots of, of, of their own achievements in other places and peoples, I mean, to the extent of just making it up sometimes. Um, um, but they also really emphasize their relationships with non-Greek speaking peoples, um, whether that's, say, yeah, my Phoenicians or the Lydians or the Trojans. I mean, not just relationships in the sense of um, 
you know, getting on well with, but actually creating sort of mythical family trees for Greek heroes that, that kind of involve all sorts of foreign heroes as well. I mean, sometimes making people up completely like Amazons so that they can then marry them and, and be part of this sort of strange, rather kind of exotic world. So, so, so the, 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 the perspective from Greco-Roman antiquity itself is utterly different from the perspective now that looks back to them as this kind of pure foundational cultures. Well, I mean, I think today, in today's world, a lot of us are fascinated by the polyglot cultures that preceded the nation state, right? There's a bit of romanticism that people have now about, say, Islamic Spain and, you know, Alexandria and even like early 20th century Baghdad, right? Which, which had a, a lot of different uh, religions and, and cultures. But, you know, it still surprises when you read about how much kind of mixture there was going back even to, to the earliest times. I mean, when you talk about the uh, artifacts that were found, for instance, in Crete, I mean, stuff coming from England, right? I mean, stuff coming from Scandinavia. I mean, you, you know, when you find what Abbasid dinars in, you know, Viking burials, I mean, and it's just, it's, it's, it's really kind of crazy how much movement there was when our normal thoughts around history is that, you know, a typical person didn't really move more than, you know, five miles from their home, right? So there, there seemed to be, at the one hand, there's this base of people that never move anywhere. You know, we read about, I think they were digging up some bog man in, in, in Cheshire, and they found that his closest, you know, relative was serving beer at the, at the pub right next to the bog, right? So the, the genetics tells us that there's this real kind of continuity, but then, you know, you see at some levels, the traders and the, and the soldiers, there's just tons and tons and tons of, of movement. I mean, do you ever get, do you ever stop getting surprised when you, when, when you read about this, when you, you, you look into this? I mean, it's, it's kind of, even to me, I, 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 mean, I it, it is extraordinary. It is, it is really important not to lose sight of the fact that most people didn't ever go very far especially most women, uh, didn't get to travel very much in most cultures, in most periods. Um, uh, it's, with, with some remarkable exceptions always. Um, it's also, I think, really important not to be too romantic about um, Islamic Spain and so on. I mean, there's been... Uh, um, well, now we're romanticizing the Hun, right? Much. So the Mongols. Now there's a whole movement like the Mongols yeah. were these enlightened, wonderful right. people. You know, oh, forget about the pile of skulls. Yeah, That's yeah. sort of a footnote, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the Mongols. The science was incredible. Um, they did uh, have some. Uh, they encouraged some great, uh, a kind of uh, sort of human, almost humanistic scholarship in some ways as well. But still, I think I would avoid getting into a kind of lengthy relationship with a Mongol in general. <laughs> I think. I mean, you can go too far. But I also think that I mean, one thing that's that's that often strikes me is how deceptive some of the things that we think of as as good evidence these things can be. So. Um, uh, so, for instance, I was born in Oxford, and I'm sitting in Oxford now talking to you. Um, and if those two facts were the only two things you knew about me, it might be perfectly reasonable to think, well, at least this is where I'd lived all my life. But actually, it's essentially a coincidence. <laughs> mm. And and I, uh, I think that that kind of thing um, can be uh, sort of if you just have somebody say um, birth and death certificates, you don't actually know how much they're moving in the meantime, whether it's to, you know, markets in the nearby town or kind of up and down the country potentially. Um, and the other thing is, is, is with different life stages that people move at. I mean, there's sort of wonderful stuff. I, I didn't in the end have kind of room to go into this in the book itself, but, um, but but there's there's wonderful evidence from genetics now from particularly from Germany from other parts of Central Europe where you can really trace through a combination of DNA but also of people's teeth enamel because of course mm -hmm. your teeth yeah. come in at different stages and so on you can tell the difference between the situation when people are born when they're children when they're adolescents if they have wisdom teeth you can even trace them kind of further so there's some amazing stuff you can do with that and what kind of comes out of that is these 
long journey, sometimes hundreds of miles, that people were making for marriage. And this is back mm. in the kind of early Bronze Age, let's say. This is basically in the end before my book began. But uh, but 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 these journeys of people who had nothing like the kind of technologies that that you know even. Uh, kind of ancient civilizations well, we think of well, now. Much of it, was, in, much of it um, was involuntary, though, right? I mean, there was a lot of movement of of slavery and and uh, <clears throat> particularly women, right, that were uh, abducted and and taken long distances, right? Right, right, and and in and in of course, you know, in the context of the early Bronze Age, we have no idea to what extent this is about, um, you know, abduction, custom. It's unlikely the women had a lot to say in the matter certainly um but this is i mean more you can trace it more clearly in later uh periods and this is very much something that i i kind of try to to come back to um frequently in the book is that um that that you know it gets it, it's, again it's against this sort of romanticism in a way of of the kind of move you the human as a kind of moving being um uh, i do think there's something to that that so many humans have been moved involuntarily um and in particular historically uh women have had you know e e e the, the sort of hardest end of that if you like um but uh yeah i'm going right up um well of course right up to the modern day but uh, but but particularly the, the viking um examples are very uh, interesting where on the one hand you have this you know extraordinary trade and as you say islamic dirhams in silver that comes all the way from baghdad maybe even further away it comes up to sweden norway and so on you know things that are made out of that silver then turn up um even further west and so on um it, it, it's really quite extraordinary but but of course what's actually fueling that what that's buying are human beings um, and that's, I think, a really important part of the story that we don't lose sight of that, in the, because of course, you know, you can't put them in a museum case. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that you talk about how trade really, for the most part, dealt with things that don't leave any mark, any historical residue. I mean, obviously, the, the things that were highest in value, things like you know, precious metals and jewels and things like that. Yeah, you know, they're they're going to stick around, and and you'll find them in burial pits and so forth. But, you know, what little evidence we have from the records of traders, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we might think of as, I don't know, perishables, you know, like leather mm. goods and, and so mm. forth and hides and things. And, and, you know, we don't really have any physical remains of that. So it's kind of invisible to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's one makes the one of the things that makes being an archaeologist just just one of the most like kind of fascinating things is that you you know you're only ever seeing a tiny sliver of the real picture and constantly mm. having to kind of think what what would have gone, you know, what 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 is this the kind of ghost of that I'm seeing here, um, and not trying to make too much of the stuff that we are seeing because also I mean the other thing is it, it's not just that stuff um some stuff survives other stuff doesn't it's also that things move in different to different degrees so if you've got something like silk for instance I mean silk's probably the perfect luxury trade good because it's extremely light um it packs down very small and it's you know you can sell it for a great deal of money people really like silk in general so you know there are viking greys with silk in um in sweden um and 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 that's kind of extraordinary uh, and you do you get this you know carnelian from india turning up in sutton who on the east coast of england that kind of thing um yeah you know, there there are uh sort of venetian style beads that turn up in north america you know before columbus gets there and so on coming coming the other way if you like so, i mean these, these kinds of things can make incredibly long journeys mm. but actually 90% of trade, 95% of trade is going to be in heavier uh, everyday goods, whether that's sugar we were talking about, um, whether it is textiles, um, whether it's grain, it's probably kind of really fundamental one. Um, uh, those kinds of things are wine. Sometimes that survives because of the containers it's in, but an awful lot of the time not. Um, those kinds of things move in different, smaller circuits. 
that's kind of can string together to make the really kind of long distance sort of magical connections. Um, but in a lot of ways, the human stories are about those smaller, those local or regional circuits, because those are the ones that people actually move in. I don't think anyone ever, no, no silk merchant ever travelled from, you know, China to Sweden. Um, I'd be very surprised if that ever happened. Um, but, you know, they do travel to the next region along or kind of, you know, we do have documentation from, you know, maybe a region beyond that where somebody picks it up and is kind of dealing with somebody of a different religion, a different language, needs a phrase book and so on. Um, so, so I think those are... And I, I want to kind of try and bring out those kinds of movements as well, because because in the end of the day, that they're the ones that actually made up people's lives. Well, but I suppose the most important trade is not in physical goods, but is in technologies and, and ideas, right? And you, you talk a lot about them too. I mean, not just sort of the spread of say, you know, the Arabic language and you know texts which were you know written in that language, but but even like stories. And you talk about how a lot of these stories would would reappear in different guises. And so a lot of the and the, and the, the divinities right seem to you know morph and, and change. And I was fascinated about you know even like you know Gilgamesh right was copied from somebody. <laughs> Else. And a lot of the, the, the stories, the Arabic stories were, were copied from, from Indians. And, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of amazing how much copying was going on at the level of, of stories and, and heroes and, and individuals. Uh, it's kind of astonishing. Right. And it's always copying with adaptation. Yeah, there's always some kind of translation going on. So I think one great example is the story of Balaam and Josephat, which is um, an extremely popular kind of set of legends um, in, in Europe in the medieval period. No one's heard of it now, but it was like a bestseller in those days. Well, everyone knew it, everyone would talk about it. Um, and uh, Balaam and Josephat is the story of... Um, um, a young man, an Indian prince, um, who uh, converts to Christianity um, against the wishes of his father, and he's converted by this Christian sort of monk, this kind of holy man um, called Balaam. Um, anyway, Josephat, which is the name of the prince, that's actually a corruption of Bodhisattva, which is mm. the, the name of the Buddha. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the future Buddha. Um, and so this story, which originates in India as the, essentially the origin story of Buddhism, um, it travels around the whole of Asia. You get versions of it in Central Asia. You get versions of it in Persia and so on. It's translated into Arabic in the 8th, 9th century uh, CE uh, as part of a big collection of all the kind of stories of the world. Um, uh, and then from there, it's translated into Georgian, where it's very hmm. popular, but in Georgian it becomes for the first time a Christian story. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to the whole story of the Buddha isn't isn't of interest there. So it turns into a Christian story. And then uh, in the 11th century, a Georgian monk translates it into Greek, and then from there it's translated into Latin and all sorts of European languages. And you know, I think by the 13th century, it's it's already reached Iceland. You have it in Old Norse. Um, and so this extraordinary story is 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 translated linguistically, but it's also constantly translated culturally. There's so many different, slightly different versions of it, kind of hundreds of manuscripts. Um, so I think that's the kind of, to me, that's really sort of emblematic of the way the world really works that people, I mean, these stories are, of course, being transmitted um, in some cases by manuscripts and writing and so on. That's a big part of it. But they're also being people are telling them to each other. And that kind of conversation is, is a huge part, I think, of the story that I'm telling. Basically, people are people are operating in so many different languages um, in Western Asia uh, in that period, um, and so what the Arabs are doing, um, the kind of Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad, is trying to kind of create essentially what we'd now call the library um, of uh, uh, all the kind of um, 
or, you know, all the interesting knowledge of the world. Um, and so from their point of view, um, they don't, there's nothing special about Greeks. There's nothing, not necessarily, there's something a bit special about Persians always, but, uh, but there's nothing, it, it really, it's all about the, the ideas and so on. And as people are translating it, they're already beginning to um, sort of work on it, to adapt it in other ways and so on, it's particularly, of course, with scientific text, medicine and so on, um, that the kind of knowledge that's coming back into Europe through usually through um, Islamic Iberia in the kind of 12th century CE is is not the kind of thing that that they you could have di translated directly out of Greek texts. It's stuff that's gone through often some other languages, but in particular, it's gone through centuries of thinking by um, sort of Arabic speaking, Islamic or Jewish um, scientists and scholars before it comes back to sort of Christian Europe. So, I, you know, I remember when Hobbesbaum came out with that book, Invention of, of Tradition, right? You know, that was a, a, a bestseller among us historians. <laughs> but it, it seems like, I mean, there seems to be a tendency where people want to believe that things are either older than they are or, I guess, you know, purer than they are. I was recently in Saudi Arabia and I was talking to uh, someone there and uh, mentioned how many of the contemporary traditions of Islam actually came from Zoroastrianism, right? And, and, and you know, they, they kind of got upset about that, right? I mean, why do people, I mean, I mean, I guess there's some people that get upset about that and there's others that celebrate, right, the, the, the muddy origins. I mean, why do people have sort of a dog in that fight? Like, why do people care about either the purity or the, heterogeneity of of origins of things we see in the modern world i mean i think this this is this is the the kind of big question isn't it what why do people have an investment in the idea of kind of a pure west um you know that, that that is facing pollution or even replacement from the outside right now. I think it's the same kind of question um and I think it I mean, part of it is just that that's an easier way to think it offers certainty i think it's it's you know, certainty is a terribly attractive thing um but the problem is that human history isn't certain it's fuzzy and complicated and and i i i, I mean if there's one thing that i i i would love for from people who read this book to um think harder about it's the idea of heritage I think this is heritage is often seen as a very positive thing in the world today. Um, but actually, I feel like there's a, there's a danger that people invest in um, a collective past at the expense of a collective present. And that, I think, is, is quite dangerous. But it is much easier, you know, it's easier to read things than it is to have conversations. That's why none of us answer the phone anymore. <laughs> Well, last question. I mean, your your area of research was the the Phoenicians, and so I, I guess I need you to give us sort of a um, a shout out to them and and kind of how <laughs> what their role in everything. And I was surprised to see that um, Phoenician used to be not just describe a a group of people or a language, but it referred to writing itself, right? And the the alphabet. I mean, right. they really were the ones right. that that got that whole ball rolling. Um, and so I think we, we tend to underestimate the, the importance of that group of people to the, to modernity. And, and I was wondering when, when you, you know, when you, can you speak Phoenician, do you travel to Malta and, and talk to the, uh, <laughs> folks there in their afraid, uh, native tongue. You know, whatever, whatever people tell you there, I'm afraid it's Arabic. <laughs> but, okay. uh, uh -huh. um, no, so, so, so Phoenician is actually incredibly similar to Hebrew. Which of course uh -huh. is very similar to Arabic, and and uh, you know these languages are actually you know much more kind of um, at least to, in my experience as a kind of outside learner, um, they're they're easier to kind of relate to each other. They're not mutually comprehensible necessarily, um, particularly between say um, Phoenician and Arabic, um, but uh, but they are they they have very very clear relationships, clearer often than than, than you know, modern European languages have, at least to me. Um, 
but no, the Phoenicians. Um, so, so yeah, so I wrote this book, um, uh, came out back in 2018, um, called In Search of the Phoenicians. And, um, the point of the book was, was, was again, it, it was, it was looking at how a modern idea, in this case, an idea about Phoenicians, Nash, as a kind of nation, essentially, had distorted ideas about the past. Um, I mean, would, so would it, it be it, similar to that, Italians? That, Right. Like, you know, the, the Genoese and the Venetians and the and those guys, I mean, they were they were at each other's throats all the time and they well, thought of themselves they, as they, distinct. They, they were in the late medieval period, early modern period, certainly. But you know, there, there are there are a lot of ancient um, inscriptions where people call themselves Italian. So it meant something to them. It may not have meant exactly what we think Italian means, I suspect. But but it's it, it's at least uh, a kind of category that has some kind of mm. ancient an idea that people call themselves that, whereas you know, as opposed to say Minoan and Mycenaean, we were talking about earlier, which are purely modern. Like nobody called themselves that, nobody called anybody else that. And so Phoenicians are kind of in the middle. That other people called them Phoenicians. These basically sailors from the modern Levant, particularly Lebanon, also parts of Israel, Syria, and so on, or what would be called Phoenician cities. Greeks call them, and we get, we get the name Phoenician because Greek authors um, describe these people as that. Um, they never describe themselves as that um, in any uh, uh, context I've ever come across, in any surviving context, at least. Um, so, so that book was kind of about, okay, if, if they didn't see themselves the way other people saw them, how did they see themselves? What kinds of communities did they form? Religion turned out to be very important to them, much more important than I think what we'd now call ethnicity or nation, but also their trading relationships were important and so on. So that was what I was interested in there. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, this book, of course, the, the Phoenicians definitely come into it too because they are my absolute favourites. Um, and and what the, the role they play in this new book um, is is that sailing. So um, they are sailing uh, at the end of the Bronze Age. They kind of are the winners, if you like. Um, they were too, they were too small. They were all the way out in Cadiz. To, uh, I mean, they, they, they went to Cadiz. Yeah, I mean... yeah, right. They get all the way from Tyre in modern Lebanon, Tyre, Side, and places like that. They get all the way to Cadiz, um, to places even further north along the Atlantic. And, and what's one thing that's fascinating to me is that it's not that they go by little stages. They don't kind of first go to Cyprus, then to Crete, then to... But they seem to just... Fir they literally sail all the way across the Mediterranean and they kind of come back and fill in the opportunities sort of on the way back, which is just fascinating to me. And, um, and so they have a huge role to play in bringing, I mean, trade goods or, or goods of some kind, but also ideas and technologies and so on, uh, right from one end of the Mediterranean uh, to the other, and also in bringing sailing technology itself uh, through the Mediterranean, which is tremendously important. And of course, one of the things that they bring into the Mediterranean is letters. And you're absolutely right, the, the Greeks call letters, letters of their own alphabet, Phoenicians. Like they, they know they come from Phoenicia. But one of the stories that I learned when I was writing this book that I didn't know um, is that, that, that although it was people from what people now uh, would say Phoenicia, um, but from the Levant, um, who, who kind of invented the alphabet itself, they didn't actually invent it in the Levant. They invented it in Egypt. Even they had to go somewhere else to find the right conditions, the right sort of inspiration, the right technologies for writing down their own language in this new and very innovative way. I mean, the alphabet's a very kind of rare beast in terms of world writing systems um, to use sounds rather than syllables. Um, but what they found in Egypt, I think, was a combination of uh, a desire to communicate, not so much with each other, but, but with their gods um, in their own language. Um, and at the same time, they were surrounded by, by these huge stone monuments and documents with hieroglyphs, all over Egyptian hieroglyphs. And every single letter of the Phoenician alphabet, which is still, you know, by various transitions, the alphabet we use today, originally came from a hieroglyph. Mm -hmm. Well, I always find it strange that we don't call what they did colonialism, right? I mean, 
in, in a way it would be obviously anachronistic, but you know, we're, we're we always do <laughs> anachronistic stuff as, as historians. Right. So, I mean, it, it, it's colonialism, right? What the Greeks were doing and what the Phoenicians were doing and you know, what, what all, everyone was doing to some degree. Well, I don't, I mean, it's a tricky one. So that's what people always used to think. That's why often their settlements are called colonies. Mm -hmm. But actually, and in some cases, certainly that's the case. You can see places where, you know, the inhabitants of a town are expelled so that a Greek settlement can be put into it in the Western Mediterranean. That does happen. But in a lot of cases, um, it's less clear the extent to which these people are the extent to which this migration is predatory. Um, on some level, it's always going to be, it's always going to be exploitative. There'd be no point in traveling, migrating and so on if there wasn't a kind of a benefit to be had from it somehow. Um, but <clears throat> there's a number of situations where it's a, a lot less clear. I mean, they weren't sort of taking over territory in general, in the early stages, at least, um, they were they were establishing rather small, you know, coastal settlements, or even settling in coastal settlements that already existed. And exactly the extent to which that was voluntary, involuntary, is very hard to tell. There are a lot of legends about these early settlements, um, both Phoenician and Greek uh, in, in the Western Mediterranean, um, that often describe them as uh, happening in a surprisingly um, uh, happy way with the uh, locals and um, uh, the the newcomers kind of intermarrying or at least trading and so on. Um, uh, <clears throat> one imagines it can't always have been like that. Um, mm. And that certainly people come in with more technology um, and, and uh, <clears throat> the ability to... Um, yeah, as I say, exploit things. I think in a way, what one of the things that makes it complicated is that again, I'm coming back to the role of slavery in this. That often I think the people who are going to be most exploited in these situations are not necessarily the people who live um, in the place where the settlers are mm -hmm. arriving, but the workers they're bringing with them. And well, that's, that's also that's well. very, very much true with uh, European settlement of the Western Hemisphere as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we haven't kind of really explored enough as ancient historians. Like, what is the overlap between this this phenomenon, which is often called colonization, even though I'm not I'm not sure that that quite has the right vibes, if you like, um, <laughs> uh, and and the process of enslavement that were being developed at yeah. the same time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just that um, the continuities, uh, you can emphasize the continuities or the discontinuities. And I think in your book, Joe, mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're emphasizing the, the continuities. You're, you're trying to break down these discontinuities, both geographically and temporally <laughs> and, and showing that uh, our attempts to demarcate these civilizations in those two ways uh, is, is ultimately um, a conceptual one and a fictional one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, when we look carefully at what happened on the ground, we, we see a much more complicated story. So I think it's, it's very much in the tradition of, of Fernand Braudel, right? <laughs> Grand history. Um, nice. how, the, how the world made the West, 4,000 year history. Uh, check it out. Thanks so much for joining me. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.